Talk once again, the show where I put a roadmap on this little piece of paper and throw it out the window and steer directly into the wilderness. That's what we're going to do here tonight. Uh, we're at Mina Mill. Um, Arts Talk is brought to you by the Toil Gallery. Got my Toil crew over here. We got Fernando, Maddie. How's it going? Uh, Rachel's missing tonight because she's on vacay. We're going to let her enjoy herself. Um, so, what we do here is we are marketers, um, we have an art gallery whole place acts as a de facto event space and as well we do co-working so other people come and use the facility for those types of things but we're marketers and we're storytellers and tonight we have a our esteemed guest is a storyteller and he has got some stories man I can't keep up with these stories <laughs> so Bob Marshall slime Bob Marshall tell us all about yourself yeah thanks for having me Something about some guy named Bob. That's a good <laughs> what question. What about Bob? What about Bob? That's a fun part of a name like Bob. Just to dispel any rumors, Bob is not my real name. It's just a nickname. My real name is Robert, but I go by Bob. It's a family thing. I come from a long line of Bobs. You'll never guess what my son's name is. And <laughs> lucky for me, I'm from a little place called Riverside, California. But I have very much gotten to venture out in the Americas, which led to all sorts of exciting things. By nature, I am a mechanic by trade as well, so that enables me to fix a lot of things, which led me into the daredevil exciting world of motorcycles. And when you get to rebuild and race motorcycles, you get to do it very well, or you might <laughs> so, I've learned to dot I's and cross T's. The fun part about that was uh, getting to do some real exciting races, getting to be, do they call it middle aged? Getting to be 30 something. Uh, I might be 40 something now. And so I got real selfish with my time, sat down, and decided to write a book. And as far as formal education, I was fortunate enough to attend RCC for five years. and get a nice two-year degree, but my, my major was music, not writing, but oh, I had wow. a great writing teacher at the time. Um, yeah, I'm one of those classically trained musician types, huh. you know, that gets to read and play. Believe it or not, I majored in vocal music, oh, wow. so that was, that was fun, but I prefer to play mandolin, guitar. For many years, I had a business where, guess what, I repaired musical instruments, mm -hmm. including amplification equipment. That was here in Riverside at the Lunch Lot. People probably don't call it the Lunch Lot anymore. It's probably, they just call it Brockton Central and Magnolia where they all come together. And uh, that was at, in the back of Music Mics, which is the old Cooper's well. music, yeah. So I ran that for many years and had a good time with that. And uh, from then on, I decided to get a real job and start working for the county. So now I take care of all the big county buildings downtown, historic buildings, the jail, a bunch of cool stuff. Believe it or not, the county of Riverside owns more land downtown than the city. So when I walk around like I own the joint, it's probably because I own I'm just kidding. <laughs> Lucky for me to be well employed. That's the uh, facilities management under EDA, county of Riverside. I serve as a maintenance mechanic for them. And that gives you some good time in the evenings to realize that it's okay to express. Music is awesome. Um, I can only be the house band for Lake Alice and Back to the Grind so many years before <laughs> I just had to get into writing. And the cool thing about writing is that anyone who can read can write. So it's great to share some of my stories, very first person, in my book. American Roadrunner. I see a copy hiding yonder. <laughs> That's why I'm pointing that way. But that was a lot of fun. And then that led to the venture of being the audio file type that I am. I started doing a podcast audio show. So I do that now, which has been very successful in that department in that world, which has led to reading audiobooks. So I have a lot of fun, even though I don't sing with my voice. I still get to use my voice to have a lot of fun with it. I do really enjoy the tone of the program, for sure. It, 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 
it has a it has kind of a I was telling Maddie earlier, it has kind of like a prairie home companion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and okay. That, I mean that in the best ways. It, it just That's feels cool. warm and fuzzy. <laughs> That's cool. I like it. It's, I think it's important. It's very important yeah. to it's not a show about talking or people talking, look what I can do. It goes back to the basic human nature that separates us from the apes, and then that is story Yeah, time. a lot of podcasting has been like, we're going to sit there and, and one-up each other with quippy right. comments <laughs> you know, for three hours. Yeah. And yeah. A little humor. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> even with this, like I was telling you earlier, you know, um, the Arts Talks was a reactionary thing to the loss of our arts world, which we love so much because we bring our community in. Kept Riverside engaged in arts, and we tried to champion that the business the best that we could. Um, and then it was gone, you know, overnight it was gone. And the question became, what do we do on first Thursdays? You know, and you just got to keep going, you just keep rolling like you on your bike, you know. So let, let's talk about this book. This is a really good book, and I haven't even finished it yet. I dug into oh, it. Oh, okay. I really got caught, like, just in the general prologue. <laughs> Great. Because you're, you've been, like, really adamant about the process. Like, the art is in the process. It it's is. not always the outcome. It's the journey. And a lot of people say that, but they don't necessarily always take a journey. Whereas you will take a journey <laughs> and be back by next week and right. have more land than people will in years, you know? Yeah. On two wheels. And that's, that's pretty wild. Um, so... I was looking through this earlier, and, and just right in the very first page, I, I noticed a few things that you weren't kidding about the process and its importance to you because you knocked it out in, in the first page. Um, always doing my best to make said road beneath mine, running on it, enjoying it, moving with purpose, all while staying alive, and all the adventure that ensues astride one of my many motorcycles. <laughs> and just for me, for someone to take a hobby and turn it into an art form that you know has some kind of lasting value is is really awesome because a lot of people they're just doing it to occupy time <coughs> and not you know putting the value out there and I, I, I do believe hobby is art um, and that how well we do it <laughs> is how good of an artist we are in that mm -hmm. hobby. And uh, you have a lot of hobbies. <laughs> I, I have a lot to, of I was trying to write down the bomb <laughs> notes here. I mean, you're author, poet, storyteller, typewriter enthusiast, master mechanic, tobacco farmer, father, <laughs> tobacco motorcycle farmer. pilot, musician. It, it just, I mean, it goes on and on and on. And um, awesome. I was at Bob's yesterday, and he showed me around all his fun tricks and toys. And I was like, Bob, where, how do you keep track of all the parts? <laughs> I mean, there's just got to be nuts and screws and washers everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> He's got it all up there. Trust him. <laughs> What's your favorite? What's your favorite thing to do right now in this world? Is it is it writing? Is it writing? Is it? No, it's it's being dad. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everything's a far second, and I don't mean to be yeah. that dramatic as a yeah. no. as a single dad that I am. But no, being dad is is definitely the most adventure. I've got a. 25 year old daughter who's extremely talented who just graduated locally from UCR. Um, I've also got a uh, 14 year old son who just started over at North, which is funny. I'm throwing out all these names. If someone's not from Riverside, watch yeah. it. Here. But no I, I live in the Poly District, the historic Wood Streets, where I was born. I own the house across the street from the house my dad owned when I was born. So I haven't gone very far in life, but. Um, having my son go to North as his sister did, just so they can be in the IB program and so they can play in the Blue Star Regiment marching band. Mm -hmm. like that's what it's all about. Unfortunately, obviously in this time, it's not happening. And I thought it would really affect him, but he's 14, like everything's changing around this dude. Yeah. So he's yeah. way cool with, yeah, so I'm doing school like on the laptop. Super like dad's all right. Yeah. yeah. Like now I get to play my drum set and be on my, you know, play a video game. You're so malleable at 14. Yeah. <laughs> so malleable. And I'm so, I'm so grace, grateful that that did not, the COVID did not affect him as, mm -hmm. as I thought it would. But he loves to play drums, so we get real excited about that. But I think all the other hobbies picking it, it has nothing to do with what I like to do better or not. It has to do with I get to do what I want to do to spoil myself. If I get home 
and I've had one of those days where it's nice and cool and I haven't broken a sweat, I'm going to jump out in the garage and start wrenching on something mm -hmm. and um, have a good time with that and get to a stopping point. Then I'm like, well, now my back hurts because I've been leaning. So let me go jump on a top rider for an hour or two mm -hmm. and figure something else out. And the fun thing about rioting is that you can always be riding several different things, just like I'm always wrenching and fixing yeah. on How's your mind medicine. when you go in there? It's just like you just try to stay, you know. Oh, yeah. It's really it, clear. Zone out. Uh, uh, have a good time. Motorcycle repair, rebuilding. The stuff that I do is very affordable. Uh, it's not big, shiny, glamour, um, Discovery Channel type stuff. Half those guys back then, they're still friends of mine. And they're doing stuff like I'm doing now. Like, it's not the big, shiny. Yeah. They're very dirty. They're very stripped down. They're very, I love, like, old Japanese cop bikes. Right. My book, for example. Mm -hmm. I, and I own four of them. I love them. I think they're great. Um, so I have a good time with, with that. And the fun to that is getting all the math figured out, getting all the precise, all the precision figured out, getting everything right, and then going back and double-checking it. You certainly don't want an axle coming loose in the middle of Montana when you're doing 90. Like, it isn't going to work. So yeah. everything's got to be, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> everything's gotta be just... legit. Yeah. So tell everybody, tell people about these these races you do. This, this... Yeah, I've, I've been real fortunate to spoil myself and, and indulge in many legal and illegal <laughs> races. <laughs> I, I have to say I'm more interested in the illegal <laughs> Right. Of course. In my head, it's always been the cars as the illegal racing, like, standard. Yeah, yeah we did whatever the I think races of, yeah. as a kid. We like, all parked on the side yeah, of the road. Yeah, that's just like, cops came. <laughs> that's my first thought. I didn't even think about illegal racing. Yeah, this, this, this stuff you do, it's, it's fascinating to me. <laughs> well, cars are cool. My cars were my dad's thing, and he was an old man. So I get it. Like, if you're an old man, that's cool. <laughs> uh, in high school and college, I had a 66 Cadillac convertible that was big and wide. It did not go fast. There was no racing allowed in that. Um, so legally, I do something called land speed racing. I'm a board member. I'm actually the sergeant at arms at the local Roadrunner uh, race club or land speed racing team. We meet at Ed Martin's garage. So I'm fortunate enough to do land speed racing, which is like the movie The World's Fastest Indian. Mm. That uh, if you've ever seen mm -hmm. that, who was that actor? He was really good. It's Anthony Hopkins. Oh, okay. Anthony Hopkins. Animal. Yes, well done. Yes. Um, so it's just like that. How fast you can go in a straight line? That I do with my family. I'm on the bike for like two minutes, hauling butt down course, and other than that, I'm just hanging out with my son camping. Mm. So yeah. we're camping in the dirt, like yeah. this is family time. Um, illegal racing, yes. Uh, I've gotten to do little bike racing, which is fun. We, I got a little Honda Rebel 250, and I will put that on a trailer behind my Goldwing and take it cross country to a little bike race. Bikes on bikes. Bikes on bikes, exactly. <laughs> so that, so that's a lot of fun, and it looks ridiculous, and that can be safety hazards all on its own because everyone in front of me they start realizing what's going on so they start pulling over into me because they're looking in the rear view mirror uh, so you've got all day long i've got cars coming at me because it's a big gold wing pulling this little honda rebel it really freaks people out i get it <laughs> i always tell my biker friends you're the only ones on the road that aren't texting so be very careful <laughs> yeah although no i'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna um, <laughs> i i don't even yeah i don't even use a map on my phone when I ride. I write down the directions off a paper map, put it on a, uh, on a piece of two inch tape and stick it to my tank. That's how I get everywhere. Yeah, I, think. I actually heard you tell me that on your podcast right before you got here. <laughs> and so it's fresh in my brain, but that boggles my mind. I didn't even know that that was a thing because I'm obviously naive to biking subculture, whatever that looks like. But mm -hmm. you mentioned like magnets mm -hmm. and what is the purpose and intentionality of that? Just like accessibility to be able to do that? The Google apps fail. Mm -hmm. A lot of the mapping oh, apps, you fall sense. out of, and then you're on a motorcycle hauling butt going, well, I think I'm supposed to turn, but this phone that I've got mounted in front of me is offline. Yeah. So yeah. now I have to pull over, I have to sort it out. I guess you can try to hit reset, you know, as if I, I can mount my phone on my tank bag and, um, so but I feel like it's more like a, a piece of mind writing it down, knowing where oh, it's yeah. at, then you have to rely on a phone. And then it's just an exercise of what you've already 
seen and gone through. You know, I go 97 miles, make a left on the 395. I go 482 miles, make a right, and in your know, whatever. Right? Like this is <laughs> how long does that thing get, man? It's all around the bike. And then, and then when you're done, you can just pick up that piece of blue tape and put another piece of blue tape down. It's just sharpie, on it. and it's big enough I can see it. I will admit, in my older age, I just can't. I got to use these to see. Sure. When you've got big riding goggles on, you can't put your spectacles on. So, you know, I was going to scroll. <laughs> right with a quill. Yeah. Right. You should be saving those. That'd be a pretty cool, like, thing to put together, right? Maybe, like, all the all places the you've yeah. gone. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they're on there for a few weeks and then the yeah, blue it's tape. Wild. And so when you try to, they just make a mess and yeah. explode. <laughs> and, yeah. It's not a, it's not a thing. Like the reusable notepad magnet thing that had your tape on there. Yeah. There you go. There you go. And, and the tape, if you just write it on, a, if you want to use a magnet, you can just write it on the other directions and use one of those heavy computer magnets. I've seen people use those and magnets and pull out hard drives and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So and there are different ways to do it, but a lot of people have tried the different GPS units. And I go into a big whining middle-aged man spiel about it in my book about mm -hmm. how the GPSs have failed on me, so screw it. I just, <laughs> I stick to the old. Mapping so system that my father taught me when I was a kid, so it works. I think about getting to places, you know, being 16 years old, my little lowrider, and and going somewhere in LA, you know, and it was just on the phone. Someone gave me some really half-assed directions on the phone, and I scribbled them down badly, you know, and we got there. That's right. Somehow we got there. It happened. Um, there was pay phones involved. There was, right. Um, yeah. There was strangers. <laughs> But, you know, we did get there, and um, sometimes I think that's lost on, I mean, there's, I guess, a lot that they know that I don't, but I think that's lost on some kids these days, is if you had to get there, could you? <laughs> you know? Oh. I, yeah, I wish I had a dollar for every time my dad threw his Thomas guide at me and said, figure it out, we got to get there. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I have college-age friends who cannot get anywhere, and yeah. they've lived here for their entire life. And I have to tell them to go left, right, X, Y, or Z. It's it's funny and painful sometimes, but your story reminded me. Josh was telling us the other day about his family from Tennessee. And it's not even like street names. It's like turn right at the yeah, second, the second red tree, barn, yeah. at the left <laughs> tree. Like he was like, That's how we, we made it. The but like... <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's yeah, um, but there's yeah. something about being on the road and like the challenges of just being out there. Yeah, know? it definitely raises new challenges, right? Yeah. Like, I drove for a living as a young guy for, like, I don't know, 10 or 12 years. I drove and drove. But there's there's something that creative that happens. I know you do a lot of your writing on the road and you, uh, Not, gather, yeah. you gather content for your writing on the road. And I, I did that too. I, I wrote a whole album on sticky notes in a parts truck. You know? Oh, holy heck. That's you know, pretty just good. Because you're out there and you're stuck with your thoughts. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. You know, like instead of letting it disappear in that moment, just gather a piece at a time, and I just piece them all together. Yeah. That's yeah. It's pretty crazy. I mean, it's kind of sad that, that we, as like humanity now, are kind of are never gonna be alone with our thoughts unless we get out there. Like unless you take a journey out there, then you'll be yeah. by yourself. And you have to put a deliberate stop to all the things. Like now, it's not. It, it's a it's a big deal to have fun. Mm -hmm. Get out there and be alone with yourself. You're due for your four-year vacation. Oh, yeah, it's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> You're ready. My last Good vacation was 2016. But it was fun. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> it lasted you this long. Bring it. Well, I think, too, we just don't take advantage of the free country that we live in. Yeah. I get real excited that I can just jump on the road and go so far. Right, you can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and just move and go and we forget too we're afraid we're going to be somewhere and get lost but it's all america it's all of these united states yeah the person that you run into in the middle of it they may be a few years behind you in trendy footwear but they're just like you they vote like yeah. you they have the same president and you're going to be okay they're going to help you and you're gonna maybe they'll freak out because you have long hair and yeah look like a pirate but other than that they're going to be okay so i i never mind i was very fortunate my father traveled a lot 
when I was younger. So I just learned travel is okay and travel is what you do and you have a good time. It's not about the destination. It's about enjoying the road right now, wherever you are. Sometimes I enjoy that road going extremely fast. My book is written around a race that I did called the Stampede. It's a cross country chopper race, totally illegal, non AMA sanctioned. That's what we mean by illegal, yeah. non AMA sanctioned. Um, or outlaws, the other term mm -hmm. that's used, of course. Uh, non AMA sanctioned race, cross country, first one there wins, west coast to east coast, 3,000 miles, different route every year. The fastest I ever did it in was just under two and a half days. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of twisted the throttle and kept going. I'd lay down to sleep for an hour and a half at four in the morning and get back up and keep going. Just wow. had a good time with it. I, I wonder, wow. like, if is it really about winning? Is that race really about winning? No. Or, or is it about, like, uh, the yeah. things? No, it's just about can you do it? Can uh, you kill it? And all the other guys that do it, there's just handful there might be a hundred people who competed in that race we still all chat today we're still all friends we bury bodies together that's you know, awesome dude. Like, that's just the, just because we competed awesome. in this race so it's it's interesting like um the the biker culture um what i really like about your podcast and your book as well is um oftentimes the projected image of biker culture is one that has some kind of uh heavy outlaw appearance at, at all times. It's the marketed version of bikers. Whereas um, in your stuff, it, there's just this really awesome part where stories get through that, that don't get through in other places because everything has to be so fantastic about this biker culture. And there's really good stories about the things that just simply happen to a human on the road with yeah. a motorcycle, yeah. um, instead of you know this this whole uh, cable TV approach to right, I never. Being out there, so it's it's really interesting to hear all those stories about the people who moved along the way and you know, the relationships you built. I know my parents um, completely on accident a couple weeks ago. They took a trip to go see my grandmother in South Dakota right during Sturgis. <laughs> nice, nice, lucky yeah, They didn't even know, it was, I mean, uh -huh. so they get out there and it's just pure mayhem, and I was like, so what was it like, you know, and I go, wow, it's so loud. I said, bikers are pretty nice, huh? He said, they were so nice, <laughs> like, they were blocking traffic for them. Right, <laughs> just, right. Just, Whereabouts in the Dakotas were they going? I don't know the little town my grandma lives in right now. Um, they kind of wiggled around from Colorado up there to her house now. Um, they were gonna. I think the Perseid meter showers were at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they got one of those like open tents where you sleep under the stars. And they visited one of those like tiny home places that you can go yes, yes. Saw my sister and my uh, brother-in-law both live in Denver. So. Well, you're right. Uh, we are very nice. Um, I've never <laughs> known much different. <laughs> I mean, all my. Unless you piss us off, then we're not so yeah, nice. There but are people. You people we're, are yeah, people. we're people like anyone else. But we deal with a lot more. There's not a day that goes by. I ride a motorcycle every day. There's not a day that goes by someone does not try to kill me with their car. So I have to work very hard to accept people are just going to people. Right. And I can't do much about it. I just have to let them yeah, be so them. Navigate you know. accordingly. <laughs> yeah, and try to save my own life. I've been very fortunate. I've never been in a major accident. I've set the bike down once or twice, but nothing major, um, just from hitting spots of oil on the road or something. Um, but it's been it's been real good to get out, enjoy America. You know, you're part of the scene. You're not seeing it through a car window like you would on TV. And any other motorcyclist I meet is very happy to to sit and chat. Uh, I do serve locally. This is my philanthropy work. I serve as a president for Abate Local 27. We're a motorcycle rights and safety organization, Abate. It's, it's nationwide, but state to state mandated and regulated. So that's great. So anywhere I go, I'm going to run into fellow Abate people, and we're going to talk Abate, and we're going to talk about whether it's helmet laws or, or you know, what you need to have on your motorcycle. To, my motorcycles are really stripped down. I know in the state of California, for example, we're supposed to have blinkers. Well, I don't have blinkers. I just use my hand and tell people which direction. Yeah. I, I wear yellow gloves so you can see what I'm doing. Um, 
and I've never gotten a ticket for it. I've been running without blinkers for as long as I can remember. It's not, you know, as long as you're not dumb, nobody's yeah. dumb. Law enforcement isn't getting to get on it. But outlaw just comes from the term of non-AMA sanctioned, right. whether it be a riding club, uh, a racing, a race, a racing organization, whatever. Yeah. So. I think some of the coolest stuff has come out of those situations. I knew a guy when I was younger who did free climbing before everyone did. And he took so much heat for it, and um, he did pass from doing crazy stuff. And I think mm. he was just happy to do that. You know, that's how he wanted to live, and it's probably how he wanted to die. Yeah. Um, but he took a lot of heat for it, and he he just he just never stopped doing these you know wild, bizarre things because we can do it. <laughs> we, right. You know, this is a, we have this one life, and you can you can live it how you choose. To. Let's let's talk about Bob the author and the typewriter enthusiast and right. the poet and <laughs> these things the are cool. You, uh, you know, take this crazy life and put it down on paper. Well, I tell you, it started. I started writing my book just as a selfish. At the time, I was dating a woman who lived in Austin. She went to bed early. Well, she went to bed on time, which was early for me. <laughs> and so I would just start writing, and that was a lot of fun. I'm writing on my phone, and then I'm writing on my super cool new laptop. Um, and I thought, well, this is okay. So I was about halfway through writing my book. My dad calls me and says, I've had a heart attack, this, that, and the other. So I go to the hospital, and I hang out with him for like five days while he's recovering from his heart attack and bypasses, this, that, and the other. And the last day he was alive, he said a few good things to me. He said, why don't you use a typewriter? Because they're old and I've got a phone and whatever. You don't know what you're talking about, old man. Why don't you grow your hair long again? At the time I had shorter hair. Because your hair is so nice, you should have. And then he said, I think I'm in too much pain and my neuropathy hurts too much to ride my motorcycle anymore. So I don't think I'm going to ride motorcycles anymore. Would you like my motorcycle? So I've learned all those, those three things, for example. And then he dies in my arms and I think he might be on to something. So I get a typewriter, which was happened to be my mother's dad's typewriter. Like typewriters are like that. They just hang around forever. Mm -hmm. um, and I really fell in love with this machine. And then I realized they're extremely complicated, similar to maybe the linkage on a carburetor only times 50. And so you got all this stuff that you're doing. You got all this stuff to repair. So then I'm repairing them and rebuilding them. And then I'm buying some because of course, I'm in like the Austin Typewriters Inc. Facebook group, and we're all like nerding out. And I've been to Austin like just to be on their podcast because, of course, they have a podcast because it's Austin Typewriters Inc. So then I'm then I'm recording podcasts for them, and then we're just talking typewriters all the time. Typewriters are the machine that brought women into the workplace. That's why they're so important to our society. They really said women can type, women can be in our workplace. So I've learned to absolutely embrace them. I'm left-handed. When I write, it smears. I can't do that. I can sit and type all day long without issue. This particularly is a letter that I started writing to you. Nice. And it just says, Dear Mind and Mills, this letter will be fully written in its entirely after this show. So we'll see how it works out. But this one, for example, is a 1946 uh, Smith Corona, black on black, glass key, semi-portable. I think it weighs 11 pounds, has a nice case. This would have been a standard typewriter that a lot of people would have in their homes. So in the was day. typing on that 74 years ago. That's right. That's, That's wow. right. Absolutely. It was brand new then. This one has some dings and damage, but I like it. And I might have like 30 or 40 of these things. But I really <laughs> makes you wonder of what all the other things that were written on were. I know, right? No, that's a big thing. Where has this yeah. machine been? Yeah. Because there's, they keep going. There's, this will not be in someone's possession seven no. four years from now. No, We're upgrading in the last two years. Right, absolutely. I got a new computer over there waiting to get transferred. Ooh. Right, that's and right. We're, we're excited because there's so many things that we can do, and my whole job is dependent on. Well, not my entire job, but most of my job is dependent on something digital. Yes. Yeah. So what if you could unplug? Tap something that the matrix Google does not see you typing, 
and it was on this. You know? We had a lot of fun painting a mural recently because yeah. Maddie's a great artist, but a lot <laughs> of it is very digital in her daily, you know. Um, and we were able to go over there and, and paint over at the Fox Theater for a few days and just, I mean, you should have seen her. She was finger painting, bro. <laughs> her hands were just covered in paint and she's just- Well, they didn't, I didn't have a brush. And I was like, well, I mean, I can like sketch it out with my fingers. <laughs> and so- Don't get it wrong, she, she did. wanted to do <laughs> <laughs> But like, you're right. mentioning making it tangible and off of a digital plane, but that's what drawing and art is for me that's at right. this point. Yeah. And that's where I started and that's why it works well in a digital world is because I care about like texture and color and all these yeah. things that real fine art taught me. Yeah. And so I'm able to go paint a giant hand when you didn't think I could just a little bit. <laughs> I trust it you. Was, it was a bold statement because I was like, hey, we're going to paint a giant hand. I think hands are just the hardest thing in the world to draw. <laughs> well, I do. Of, this whole thing not, is what separates easy. us from the apes. Yeah. yeah. This is I mean, I, it's just the hardest thing. I like, you chose a hand? Oh, okay. They, they <laughs> it's they a 14 foot mural. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a big hand. And that's one over on the box that like, comes out. I've seen it. It's pretty cool. Good for you. I like typing. I, I'm not very good at it, but I like it. Certain types of things are just therapeutic to me, and the typing is one of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think so, on the clickety-clack. And I'll tell you, again, it goes back to process. This machine is just part of my creative, my writing process. I do all my rough drafts on this. I just clunk stuff out. If it's wrong, I don't, like, white it out. I just go back and use the letter D yeah. da, 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 and pass over mm. it. And then start again. It's not a big right. deal. Yeah. It'll look a big mis mix, ma mix matched. Um, then when I'm ready to move that to the second draft, instead of rewriting like you would on a computer, rewriting, editing, I completely rewrite it on my computer. And I do that. I literally put this up in front of me on my computer and I'm typing and mm -hmm. I'm rewriting as I'm. So it's yeah. much more efficient for me yeah. as a prompt. That's just my process of writing. That's what I enjoy. So, so it's not as like. A and it can means to get the ink for these machines or anything? No, yeah, the, mm. the ribbons themselves, you can get them offline, you can get them at Staples if you need to sometimes. Mm. You can imagine I re-ink them, I've got like a whole rebuilding room in my house where I just kind of rebuild typewriters. I've seen this room. It's a little There's geeky. A lot of typewriters. <laughs> That's dope room. though, it's so sick. It's a, it's a little geeky. I think people enjoy that too though, you know, you know, it's a... I feel like I, I, for some reason, feel like I gotta do this in one. I can't mess up. You know. I have to blame my mom for making me touch my typewriter. There was one in our hallway, and I was never allowed to touch it. And I would sneak in there and push keys, and she wasn't looking because I liked the noise that it made. It's such a sensory experience. It has a. You clock. ruined her thesis. It's like you're moving she forward. in that class because yeah, you. Yeah, no, that was it was like pretty and it had like it was like my great grandmother's or something. But I think that's why I feel like they're so rare because it was like special and on a shelf, but it had a fake bird nest and some. I was like a prop. It. it was a decoration. That's not at how that you point. teach. Treat I know. I'm so sorry. I know. Office but equipment. It was cherished at that yeah, point. Sure, like sure, it was sure. on a shelf, and it was something that was lasting, but in a whole new way. Well, and, and we're very lucky here in Rivers. There are still gangs of people who dig these. We actually have a typewriting studio over in the Life Arts building that another gentleman has. Yeah, yeah. Really nice. yeah so we're, we're very fortunate to have that. A lot of my machines I get offline or locally for a few dollars. I rebuild them and just try to get them into people's hands, you know, as a creative instrument. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I do a local typewriting club. I was until this COVID thing hit. But we'd meet every Sunday night and everyone would bring their machines down oh, and we'd all exchange machines and try each other's machines. And, you know, and it, yeah, and it, people would bring their kids room. and all yeah. the kids. Oh, are, I can hear it. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's great to see the kids just uh, totally different creative mm -hmm. instruments. So I remember typing class in high school. There's not a lot that I remember from high school as far as like big value in learning. You know, I got through mm -hmm. it and learned the math and the stuff, but um, I took a typing class it was a friend of the family, so I had to behave in there. You know, I was a rowdy oh, kid in high school. Okay. Um, but it was this sweet lady we knew. I knew we were all growing up, and then she was my teacher in there. So I had to, I had to, my buddy Jamie sat next to me, and he was rough around the edges too. And we didn't really want to do this at all. But the thing that I learned in there, because I had to do well enough to not, you know, hear the stories from Grandma, <laughs> was I learned the basic functions of typing. 
and sure, I'm just sure. so thankful that I did. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not amazing at it, but I type with all ten fingers, and instead yep. of having to wait, and I and I like it. I like the other way yeah. I want to do it. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I'll ever get any better than I am at it now. <laughs> well, it's good. It's good practice, I think, too. If you use a typewriter and you do get very comfortable in that practice, right? It's way more do. deliberate of a yeah. Well, you, yeah you, you just you got to get into the rhythm and it's the rock muscle and muscle memory. It's a deliberate motion. Or my keyboard barely moves anymore. So I got a new upgrade on my computer, and now I the keys are this those. thin. Yeah, those drive me nuts. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> I learned how to type and they give us a, an off, on a computer, not a typewriter, but they give you like a plastic sheet to go over the keys so you can't even look. Right, they're called brown keys. Yeah. Like the, oh, and those tests. Keys, yeah. mm -hmm. My mom typed a lot when she was um, younger and to this day, like if I hold her hand, she's still typing things as she talks. Mm. Wow. She, you'll That's notice, like, cool. You'll see it on the table and That's... stuff. She, when she's talking, she's literally typing the words just, it, it never went away. Muscle memory. Yeah. That's crazy. Muscle memory. Well, I very much enjoy that. And it is nice to throw this machine or one of its brothers or sisters on the back of the motorcycle, travel to the middle of nowhere and just yeah. bang that's away cool. That's cool. wherever I may be. And a lot of time it's just kind of notes and outlines, like you said. I rarely stop. I don't stop in the middle of the race and start typing, of course. That would be... Well, maybe I will someday when I'm older. But now I don't. You know, I'm too excited to... <laughs> Put in good times, yeah. Finish the race, but it's great to, um, yeah, wake up and I just prefer to type instead of write. So a lot of writers like to write, but anyone can use these machines. They're just a little different than a computer keyboard that we use today. I highly encourage everyone to go out and grab a typewriter or come uh, play on one of mine and have a good time with them because they're they're a lot of fun and they're still somewhat affordable, not too much. But can you type? This whole book on? No, no, not at all. Most of that book. Some of the outlines, uh, the stuff I had to do near the end, I would do rough draft. And that's part of figuring out the process. And I think that's funny. Everybody has a process for reading. Most people pick up the book, look at the front, and then they turn it over and read the back. Mm -hmm. So like all the back content, I had to type it out and then work off that. And then, you know, but for the most part, I'm going to tell you most of that book I wrote on this. And yeah. not like on my phone, but I mean on this particular phone. That's all this phone is. The Note 4, right? So, um, I keep the old phone because it's small. I love it. I oh, yeah. Can't handle these things things. Well, I, I, I fell in love with this one 10 years ago, and I've just been rock. So a lot of that book I typed like this. And that was my process, and I'd go home on the laptop and edit it. And I love editing my own work. I don't know what my problem is. I love mm. just getting it just right on. It's nice to massage it. And then I send it to an editor who chops it up and reminds me it's not right on and I'm yeah. putting commas in wrong places Gosh. and explanation points. And yeah, when writing like is your art, it, you have to find a way to love doing it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I like writing in cursive. Every song okay. I've ever written, I have a final cursive mm. draft. I don't know why, I just cool. enjoy it. Um, it's not the best when you're trying to read it back. <laughs> you know? Right, right. But That's okay. I, I, I just feel like I have to have a completed cursive version of each one. And if and you can read, you can write. And... Yeah, do it your way, man. Mm -hmm. Whatever you got to do. And I, I sometimes just do it in all red with a lot of spaces in between each sentences. I don't know. Just in my mind, it fits right. Like, like oh, it has breath. Nice. Like, there's yeah, breath yeah, in yeah. the sentences. Like but it's just cool because it gives it room to, like, Really There's also a lot of reason. room to breathe in your poetry. Yeah, he yeah. does a lot of visual arts where the words are. I mean, he's kind of describing a moment that you're looking at. There's a lot of space there, <coughs> you know. So it, it almost matches what you're doing. Yeah, the way uh, it turns out. It's pretty strange. Like sometimes I'm like, I like I'm kind of embarrassed. I'm like, what the fuck? people are looking at this. Like, <laughs> What's wrong with this kid, man? You know. So I just kind of do that. But do you take like any inspiration from like any like writers or? Or authors out there or anything like that? That's funny. You're not wrong. There are, it's not any author of anything you enjoy is probably going to be written on a typewriter. Um, it was not uncommon for them to use the biggest, newest thing. Louis L'Amour used an IBM Selectric 2, which is a big, clunky 80 pound machine. Cool. Like that was a new technology where Louis L'Amour, for example, writing old westerns, Zane Gray would write everything by hand, and then he had a transcriber, female typist, that followed him everywhere, a secretary that would type his transcripts out. So everyone does it 
a bit differently, and you'd be amazed who still writes yeah. on these. I piece things together. Like, I was telling you, I, I wrote a lot of music while I was out on the road. Yeah. I, I just write small pieces, and then they'll often just kind of come together like a mm. puzzle. Oh, and sure. Then, yeah. And you, you, it's, like, it's like a post-it note at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you, or you get a bin, you have an idea. I use folders, but I've got a buddy who uses bins. He wants to write on a topic. He's got bins in his office. He writes, types something out, throws it in the bin, types something out, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. however you want to do it. That's interesting. Yeah. I just do file folders. Mm -hmm. I right. just pop a page in whatever. I want to write this about this. I'm very fortunate to have three or four themes, fiction, nonfiction, whatever, that I'm writing right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm having... A lot of fun with it. What I decide to have published next, we'll see. I don't know because I get busy with, you know, my audio show, my audio books, yeah. all the fun <laughs> stuff. I got a lot of stuff in the fire now. I love the podcast. I want to go back and listen to all of it again. I listened to a little bit. I met Bob uh, last year. Um, it was Connie's motorcycle art show. Yeah, that was. Tell a good us about one. the art of the part of your book. You were, you were telling yes. me about this, fellas. So here's a trick to hiring an artist. Artists are inherently flaky. <laughs> so you have to work very hard <laughs> to find an artist. They could be your best friend. They could be your biggest fan. If they're busy working, they may not give. And that's okay. Yeah. That's more than okay. I get it. So, And I've had people call me and they're like, can you write me this? And I'm like, that's really not what I do. I cannot. You mm -hmm. know. So right. the trick to hiring or finding a good artist is finding someone who very much believes in the product that they want to do. So I was very fortunate. The gentleman who did my art, his name is uh, Bo, Bo Monster, is his uh, B-O-M-O-N-S-T-E-R, Bo Monster. And he does etch art. So it starts black and then he mm. etches it out to make it clear. So he's got all these blades. He's, he's right-handed, so he does it as such. He does really neat stuff. I just kind of sent him a text like I've seen you have the shows a few times I'm a big fan he's like oh no I remember you're one of the stampeders there's only a few stampeders we, we usually walk around with a patch on us somewhere that says stampede and everyone if someone's cool enough to know what the stampede even is <laughs> cross-country chopper race whatever done like you know, yeah right <laughs> part of it yeah Right. That's my only resignation with that one. That and, so and that's okay. But <laughs> motorcycle riders or maybe there's nine, ten million people who ride motorcycles. There's twenty two million people who are bird watchers in this country. So you're doing just fine if you don't. <laughs> more people watch birds and ride motorcycles. Really? That's okay. Oh yeah. That's it's the sad sad. more people classify themselves as bird watchers. Right. <laughs> I think they I think they call themselves birders now. Oh, bird? Okay. Oh, kind of no, they call them full bird, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they call themselves oh, birds. <laughs> They're going full bird. Oh, That's gosh. great. I was fortunate enough to reach out to Bo Monster and go, hey, I need art for this book. He goes, oh, the book said, okay, well, send me the first chapter. So I sent him the first chapter, and an hour later, he calls me and goes, dude, I'm in. This is awesome. That's like, I've got this so idea. The that idea. Your book, yeah. I, I just got stuck. I was like, man, why haven't I read Bob's book completely in its entirety? He's like, now i got to catch up, and we'll talk about it on the next one. <laughs> it's fantastic, man. I, I, I like the approach. I mentioned it earlier. I like how you've simplified the process of it, and uh, same thing in the podcast. Um, a couple of things I, I listened to. The it's just like I had to get in that moment where I'm 300 miles from anywhere, and all I have is the things that are strapped to this machine mm -hmm. that could kill me. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's <laughs> that's wild stuff. That you dude. put together yourself in your carriage shed behind your old house. In the right. Backyard. Yeah. You really it's have to depend on your own capabilities, man. Yeah. What do you try to take from each, like, you know, journey, I guess? Is it is it, like, the people, the, the yeah. scenery, or what I'm, do you try to take? I'm very fortunate. I go out with an open mind, and everything just falls at me. That's it awesome, could be man. positive, could be negative. Whatever the negative is, you try to turn it into a positive. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been in a fist fight in the gas station. Oh, really? I've, I've been somewhere where a woman just tries to tackle me because she thinks I'm so sexy. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, like, I've, the best that's the thing journey, is worth. Yeah. That's, that's road. And, that's and road awesome. to life is like that. It goes up, it goes down. You can do it. Any way you want. It's probably that long hair, Mr. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just pick that up again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you got a fan out, so you just kind of You're hilarious. Of 
Yeah, yeah. I, I've had long hair more than I've had short hair in my life. I've been forced. My whole family were blessed with good hair, so I'll just take <laughs> it and keep rocking it. Hey, man, work with what you, work with what you got. Yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. But, no, I, I don't go out with many expectations, except I hope I survive so I can come back and enjoy my children. So I keep I keep on that, and it turns out How, really how do they well. deal with it, man? You know? Oh, I think they're used to it. Like, Dad's off on another race across <laughs> country. We'll see him in a week, whatever. Or, you know, Dad's doing this, Dad's doing that. I'm real fortunate. I will tell you, so what I end up doing, I've got a wonderful friend. Uh, her name's Renee. She worked as my secretary for many years, still does cool stuff. So she's my proxy. I just, if anything goes wrong, every, the kids know, like, Renee will take care of everything. Oh, that's so that's nice. my secret in life. <laughs> I've got someone who I trust my children with who that's will take care of everything. Probably, yeah. yeah, I'm very fortunate. Yeah, especially this day and age, it's hard to do this. Yeah. You mentioned earlier in the prologue the process portion, yeah. and that's the part that I had listened to earlier today. I haven't gotten the opportunity to read it yet. Uh, do you feel like there's a significance in the difference in your process between writing and mechanics and writing and because I've learned so many times and for artists especially being around them all the time we speak that language of needing a process or having a process Ernesto my coworker, walked by my desk and I have my laptop and my other laptop and the iPad like Right. Everything laid out in a grid system. I'm like, every morning I do this. And then I go upstairs and I get coffee. And there's a cadence to my routine now that it is just so cyclical that it makes it easy to know what's next. And it keeps me efficient. But I also think it promotes my own creativity when I'm in the zone. right? And everybody has a different take as what that looks like. It's sometimes in your day to day, yeah, but I'm like, pew, 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 yeah, pew, you, pew, I don't, yeah, I don't know what it takes. Get a text to get you. over here. Yeah. I'm over there. Oh, I forgot the thing upstairs. Hey, I'm some people, you know, the other thing. <laughs> they work in that like crazy kind of like manic yeah. sporadic thing. It just really depends on the individual, right? Yeah. yeah. I enjoy sitting on my motorcycle and relaxing while doing 100 miles an hour on the highway and just enjoying <laughs> the scenery and dodging big rigs and watching out for Johnny Law. And I enjoy sitting in a big comfy chair or a freaking milk crate uh, typing on a machine and just getting lost in my thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's all the same. I'm very fortunate that I figured out what kind of works for me as a process. And it seems very inefficient when I'm doing it. But then I get to a stopping point. I'm like, that worked out really well. <laughs> I'd really enjoy sharing with people yeah. that if you feel like your process is inefficient, but you're getting a very good end result, like mm. motorcycle not falling apart in the middle of nowhere yeah. on me, you're doing it right. <laughs> like it doesn't yeah. matter how long yeah. it takes. Spoil you, yourself, you enjoy said, yourself. Your best is going to be good enough for whatever you need to conquer at that time. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's fantastic, right. you know what I mean? Because really, the, 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 all I gotta do is get through each of these moments. I know Fernando, he's, uh, sometimes he's like thinking way into the future, and yeah. I love it. Because mm -hmm. you, you know you need that horizon to 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 drive towards you know, but I go don't forget about <laughs> what yeah, you got to get do to yeah. get through the day or the, what's right underneath you know. Man. Yeah, yeah, it's big. It's a big part. You have to navigate the road that you're on mm -hmm. by always looking ahead just a little bit to yeah. see how the where the how the road goes, where it goes, where are the potholes, where are the bumps, left rats. Yeah, pops told me look, look on the road. You know, that's right. But it doesn't mean you don't pay attention to mm -hmm. the kid that's you know coming out of the yeah. driveway on their bicycle. Yeah. Because um, you know you get you know, you get a flat tire and then what do you do? Do you know what to do? <laughs> yeah. Well, I blew a tire last time I was racing. I hauled up to Nevada. One of the things I enjoyed doing, and I talk about it a lot on my show, is the ride one k in a day personal challenge. For a lot of people, it's very tangible to ride a thousand miles in a day. On their own motorcycle by themselves so the ride one can a day self challenge puts it out there they certify you for doing it um, i'm one of the aficionados i can certify people you collect fuel receipts and then you do a nice write-up and i produce it a story on my show so i'm reading <laughs> someone else's story of what it took for them to ride a thousand miles in 24 hours on their motorcycle wow. and it's it's very exciting a lot of them are brand new some of them do it like every month of their life like this is what they live for it's all very exciting story mm -hmm. so ride one candidate you can find them on instagram facebook you know they've got a website 
it's really good stuff. So I'm very excited that things like that exist. Just a nice self challenge. I was doing one with my friend Eula two months ago, and we were up in Inyo Kern, and we're doing 100 miles an hour at 11 o'clock. No one's out. Shit. And the back tire on my dad's bike just explodes. Oh, I took my dad's that bike. That sounds absolutely terrifying. <laughs> it was horrific. <laughs> it was the most scariest moment in my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm all over this two lane, oh, 395. Shit. It's at the top. <laughs> Buell is behind me freaking out. You know, and we stop and she goes, are you okay? And I'm like, <laughs> no, I need to cry. I think I pooped myself into the guy. You know. Um, Thank God I got the bike to stop. I had to try a few things to get it to stop. But I got it to stop and the tire was toast. I just hit something or I got a small leak and it wore out and I didn't feel it because I'm going so fast and it exploded. So I had to get a tow. Beulah finished her ride 1K in a day. She finished it. She's certified. I am not. I <laughs> lost. She won. That's it was right. awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and Beulah does Them's her. Them's the breaks. Them's the breaks. You got to deal with it. You got to finish. Yeah, and Beulah does her own uh, motorcycle podcast with Connie, Girl yeah. on a Moto. Yeah, it was great. Connie, she's quite Girl busy. on a Moto team. They had their art show here, mm -hmm. which you were a part of. Yeah. And then we did uh, the Riverside County Poetry Night. That was awesome. Oh, that was, that was so much fun. There was I so many good that. readers there that night, I, and they were all over the board. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. As far as. The things they said, uh, Fernando was a part of it. Everybody. Yeah. Had, it was had super, like, uh, just diverse. diverse. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was really cool to hear everything. Callie yeah. from Atlantia Institute. Yeah. She absolutely. showed up. I'm a big fan of hers. Atlantia does some really neat stuff locally. Yeah. If you need to write or anything art related. Remember him? Oh, yeah. I don't remember that guy. I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> Larry's a good friend. He's a very talented writer and, and teacher. We're very fortunate to have him in our area. I just love the creative process. He goes, he's like, yeah, I wrote this with AI robot. <laughs> you know, like, me, me, and, me and this robot wrote this, and then, then I put it on this uh, paper bag. <laughs> he's just the greatest. Right, right. I love the guy. The last one he came to me for was, could you repair my typewriter? Because I want to write a book on trash, and I need the typewriter. The, uh, so he wrote the that was like the kind of the start of it, I think. I think he, he wrote a trash book. It's a trash book. <laughs> That's amazing. It's complete. You can read this thing, actually. Wow. I think it's found it. Book made of trash that's, that's all held together, and you wrote it on a typewriter that I rebuilt. It's very exciting. <laughs> it's very nice. Larry's a good wow. creative type. Yeah, he'd be a good one. We're real lucky, too. Uh, I had Christmas dinner with uh, Dan Bernstein, who had an article in the press for a long time. Yeah. You know, um, So it's very fortunate. I'm also neighbors and friends with one Mr. Raymond Smith, who was a public information officer for the county for 20 years. And before that, he was an article writer, journalist for the Press Enterprise. So terribly talented. I'm so fortunate to be surrounded by talent. Um, and I think that goes for my audio show, too. Uh, I've got a lot of friends who are in old radio. You know, all the people we've heard on the local radio stations, I'm friends with half of them. It's freaking awesome. Yeah. So that's how I learned to do a good show in audio, and that's how I got into, you know, reading audio books. I've got a copyright on another book that someone else's. It's a whole book of poetry, so I'm reading that right now. Um, I'm finishing up that book. That book's all done. I'm just, it's some loading stuff. The book's finished, though, so that's fun. Um, I've got all sorts of other stuff that I'm producing for other people, um, so I got into audio books, using my voice, having a good time, comprehension, and there's a lot of stuff I want to do with that. And I built a studio in my closet. You've been in this closet? <laughs> yes, it, yes, it's a microphone, <laughs> closet, screens, and then the computers. It's a closet in my bedroom. So the computer's next to my bed. It's hilarious. Fantastic. It, it puts out great quality stuff. So yes, if you hear my, my motorcycle show, the American Roadrunner Motorcycle Show, uh, in podcast format, it is recorded in my closet. That is a really great podcast, even for someone as, um, I mean, I'm dumb and blind to motorcycle culture, except for I've got some friends that ride bikes. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, you got some cool friends that ride bikes. <laughs> you got some good friends. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really it's really entertaining without even having to be that part of the culture, you know what I mean? Because you don't leave the, the other listeners out of the story. And in mm -hmm. fact, you really invite them in. You know, Absolutely. you try to teach them something about the process. If you want to do this, you can. There's motorcycles and there's roads. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Go. Yeah. Have a good time. Yeah. I think people too. They think 
motorcycle riding is not for me. I don't want to dress like a pirate. You don't have to dress like a pirate. <laughs> we are the only country in this world where we do not utilize motorcycles as a tool. It's very sad. Yeah. I don't know about yeah. you all. I spend 28 cents a week commuting on motorcycles right. compared to... So I don't yeah. know how other people do it in these very expensive cars that we were sold as okay. Get on a motorcycle. I mean, have a good time. Enjoy the open road. Enjoy splitting lanes. This is California. Save yourself time. Save yourself life. Are you going to get an accident? That would suck. But what if everybody, not everybody, what if single men under 30 started riding motorcycles? We would have zero congestion. Yeah. That's, a, that's a number. But again, I'm an abate <laughs> member. I can go on and on with numbers like this. So I think in the future, we're going to have to embrace that cars are getting too expensive. Motorcycles are terribly affordable. Learn to ride. Have a good time. Take a class. It's like learning to skydive. Terribly fun. Bring your girlfriends, bring your boyfriends, whatever, mm -hmm. like freaking rocket. How long is that class? Just a weekend. Just a weekend? Yeah, mm -hmm. you get an extra endorsement on your license. Yeah, it's like learning to skydive. It's a, it's a ton of fun. Mm -hmm. And it's a great trait that you can use forever because motorcycles are everywhere. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with me being some wannabe cowboy from the wild, wild west. It just has to do with... <laughs> getting in a bar fight. So don't be yeah. getting in a bar fight. Yeah, no, there's, not, there's none of that. If there's a bar fight, I'm... <laughs> Probably run it away, yeah. but no, I, we really tried to avoid those. I reckon there's a few scraps, but nothing different than, it's not like the movies or TV yeah. shows. I'm just going to throw it out there. So no, we, we, we have a real good time with it. So anybody who can ride a bicycle can ride a motorcycle. Have a good time with it. I have. I'm still here. I've been riding most of my life. I stopped for a handful of years there, but for the most part gotten to really enjoy the open road motorcycle and what road means to me as I believe it means to everybody the process of enjoying the now because we're always so busy future destination retirement whatever we may not make it that far yeah. I'm very interested in the now so these are the types of middle-aged philosophies I enjoy expounding in my writings and I think that's what people relate to it doesn't always have to do with two wheels mm -hmm. Um, Are you self-published? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I own my own publishing company. Oh, okay. That's yeah. pretty good. So I started my own publishing company and just put that out. And that's why it's nice. That's why I get busy publishing other people's stuff, oh, yeah. whether it's audio, whether it's print, whether it's... I've got about six things in the fire right now that are all about ready to explode. So it's a lot of fun to create, but I love that. And now when we asked you to do this, I, uh, I was like, Bob doesn't have time for this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I'm so happy to hang out and have an excuse to... To kick and chill with yeah. you guys. It's nice to not be in the studio tonight, mm -hmm. not be in, at a typewriter. I feel so like sometimes fun. you need that time to miss your your craft, right? You need oh, time yeah. to miss your craft. Yeah, big time. The more you get away, the more you'll want to get back. And I don't, if I get home and don't feel like writing, I won't. Yeah. I'm fine. Just hanging out with, you know, I, I've got a buddy who is a recording engineer. I've got friends who are girls. I, like it's a. I've got you children. Got things to do. Like, I got things. <laughs> you yeah, got things to I don't do. mind. Like just enjoying. Now life. sometimes you have to know when to stop or break. And you said it. You said it in your book. Uh, if you need to stop, just stop. Just stop. <laughs> and I think the key word there is need. You know what I mean? Yeah. You gotta know. You don't don't give up whenever things get tough. But yeah. if you need to stop, take a stop. break. Because <laughs> yeah. you have to, or else you won't do yeah. well the thing you're trying to do. Yeah. And what's the point? And and there's, the, uh, oh, sorry, ahead. there's something to be said for like cranking out a hobby and beating the death out of it, right. you know, like creating and working on things. I would grow up with my dad working on stuff in the shop, and he's very much a has three of everything kind of person. Um, but we would look for everything and find everything and fix everything that we needed to. But he does that every day, and he's never beat it to death. Like he so enjoys like tinkering, but like creating sometimes it's like. I'm working on stuff here, or I'm painting other places, or I have X, Y, or Z, because I'm all over the place in more ways than one. But we beat it to death after beating it, like working on things so many times over and over. 
I don't know if you ever get tired of anything that you're working on. Do you ever get sure. frustration? Oh, like yeah. I used to. Things. Yeah, I used to fish a lot. Actually, I was <laughs> shark hunting in the ocean. I had a big ocean boat. I would catch like these monster, you know, two, three hundred pound makos and threshers. And it was awesome. And not for me. It was expensive. And after a few years, I was done. It was <laughs> good. You know, like yeah. the boat. And the but you part. did it. <laughs> I did it. Yeah, I've got like teeth and jars in oh, my house. Like it's awesome. Cool. Yeah picture well no not we didn't really have cell phones back then to take pictures but whatever it was awesome i've caught big shark cool that's one did you guys like eat the, it oh yeah, yeah. Of course, right? oh yeah oh, no, it how's it taste whatever you throw at it that's what it tastes like oh. it's, <laughs> it's absolute you that's want up. it to be cajun do cajun you want it to be you know, classic steak seed, do steak. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> Maple syrup. Maple syrup. <laughs> oh, oh. So I think you get to that point, and every few years you might find me out on a cattle or charter boat. We call them cattle boats out on the ocean. But, you know, you'd find me out with a nice 30 pound test rod in the water and just kind of seeing what's out there. But I'm okay not chart fishing again. And that's a wonderful thing about anything anybody does it serves you, you don't serve mm -hmm. it. That's why I don't mind having projects around my house. I've got three or four writing stations. I've got two or three motorcycles apart in the backyard. Like, I'm okay. It's yeah. going to serve me when I'm ready. I'll visit that yeah. tomorrow, the next week, whatever. Yeah. I have to bounce around the projects. I could never just just do one thing and yeah. devote myself entirely to that one thing. I'd have to find little escapes from it, even if it was other projects. I think it could depress people, too. Like, yeah. I haven't Definitely, finished this. Yeah. Shame on me. No, yeah. you don't serve it. It serves you. I still want to, sometimes I just want to play music. Do you still write music? No, I've never been the biggest music writer. I wrote some classical pieces, but for the most part, playing mandolin and guitar, mm -hmm. all the music, all the good music's been done. I'm cool. Just like freestyling and playing. And yeah, playing. jamming, uh, reading. I've done some classical pieces, um, but mostly... Right, rock and roll, bluegrass. I've made most of my money being a bass player mm. in, in rock bands. I like the music selections on your, on your podcast. I heard Mac on there. And like, oh, and yeah. There. Yeah, and I've got all that in like a road um, list. It's on my YouTube channel as well as... Uh, oh, you have it all compiled on there? Yeah, as oh, well as cool. Spotify. Yeah. Like you can find oh, it all on nice. there. Songs, songs of the road, songs yeah. from the road. Yeah, it's, so that's a lot of fun. So all that's on there. It was great just to include the music that's always playing in my MP3. And that's a big thing, too. People think, uh, yeah, no, I'm listening to audiobooks. I'm, I'm rocking music, and I've, I've played books for people in the car. And they're like, so you're racing choppers cross country. Listen to this philosophy, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance on audiobook. Yes, yes, I am. It's that's okay. awesome. Mm. I don't mind. Um, I've got friends who read audiobooks too, so I'll put those on so I can. Here's a friend reading me a book. This is very so comforting in the middle of New Mexico at two in the morning. Like, I'm good. Yeah, so. A friendly voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. Yeah, I was reading your book earlier to like um, some of those sound healing bowls. A friend of ours came and recorded sound healing stuff. Okay, you know? that's cool. And, so I, I was reading that, and it was really interesting, like, to, to, it was mostly just checking our work, the audio, I didn't record it myself, it's in our studio, and, um, you know, I, I know that you're supposed to really, like, relax in this process, and let your mind go blank. I read the first chapter of your book while I was listening to it, and it was weird because as I read and I got into the reading of it, it all the, it all kind of went into the background, and it was all still there, and very loud and prevalent in my ears, I had the headphones on. Um, but they kind of become one, you know, I was, mm. I, I have a really hard time re reading or working to any kind of musical lyrical mm. value in it because, you know, it just kind of fights with my brain. Um, but instrumental music um, is, is big for my creative process or just some, someone talking in the background. Like, mm. Yeah. Pure yeah. silence, it doesn't last long. I'll catch myself in it after a little while. Something has to change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can feel an anxiety, like what the heck's going on? It's yeah. just too quiet. I can hear my bones yeah. freaking growing. Came downstairs and, shit, you know? yeah. and everybody was quiet down here. And I was like, is everything okay? Like I, I instantly associate silence with like bad things. Yeah, you get in my studio for too long. You know, we got sixteen or twelve, and so it's like, 
Right. right. And you get in there for too long, you'll start to hear a little crackle in your ear. Mm-hmm. It's right. just your own body. Right. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> no, I don't mind. I've had people at my house and they go, it's really quiet. Do you have a TV or something? <laughs> no, I don't have a TV. I do. It's hooked to the VCR on the cabinet. I don't ever turn it on. But I don't, yeah. you know, I just, it's audio books for me. Yeah. So I'm good. Every so often, 96.7. You know, KCAL rocks, yeah. but for the most part, you know, audiobooks. Uh, we're very, I, I mentioned that because the next show that comes out will be one of the uh, DJs on 96.7. Her name's Lacey, Lacey Kendall. She's, a, and she rides motorcycles and loves them. So she goes into this great history of it, as well as like interviewing Slash and getting to smoke in the studio during, and I remember the city's stories. Yeah. The night. It's, it's all just stories, and it's, kind of has something to do with, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. We're all human. We all have stories, and that's what makes us all exciting. Just don't tell me long stories, stories at the gas station when I'm on a race. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, I get those sure. sometimes. Sometimes people are I'm on a race, man. He's got an eight-minute limit there. at the gas station. That's how he gets it. <laughs> Boom. I got to go and make it happen. People start talking. And uh, so I broke this stress ball, and now there's like, oh it's white stuff <laughs> all over me. This is great. I bust. So I did this in my.